I'm going to start out by asking you both, how did you first get involved in the crime victims movement and when? I'm sorry. We first got involved in 1993 following the death of our daughter Mary. Yes. She was murdered by a former boyfriend who we thought was in jail. But the police assured us that he could not make bail. However, a woman claiming to be his sister posted bail for him and he was released. He stalked her and on the evening of her 21st birthday he murdered her. This is how we first got involved in the uh, criminal justice system. And what was your experience in the criminal justice system specific to Mary's murder and the case and the whole um, issue of information and notification? I like to think we were very lucky because we came into the the system when there were some rights for victims and I feel that we were treated fairly and uh, as hard as the whole process was uh, as good you know we we got as good as we could get. Um, you're you're both known as sort of being the parents of automated victim notification. How did that come about as a response to all the tragedy you went through? Uh, I think it was primarily we got the attention of the news media and we were fortunate in getting some press. But then we live in Jefferson Town, Kentucky, and the Jefferson Town Police Department uh, was not involved. However, they did help us quite a bit in the city of Jefferson Town put up $60,000 as seed money to the city of Louisville to develop a computerized victim notification system. From this money, Mike Davis and Young Nugent, two young engineering graduates from the University of Louisville, started putting together the system in the basement of the Jefferson County Jail. From this programming, the Vine system started within the city of Louisville. Following that, the city of Louisville took $100,000 to the state of Kentucky and presented it to Governor Paul Patton as a challenge to the state to put in the Vine system. About a year and a half later, Vine became law in the state of Kentucky, and this was the first state to have it statewide. Now there are 14 states, I believe, that have Vine statewide and hundreds of counties throughout the country that now use the Vine system. I like to think it, it was the best of citizens and industry and government coming together to work for the good of everybody. And uh, Pat, th that partnership you described, the, the three, does that happen very often in social justice issues or in... Um, I haven't seen it happen <laughs> very often. Yeah, that's just kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, when, when, you, when you first were, were sort of forced to enter the criminal justice system 10 years ago, what was the context of the era? You're a little bit different from some of the other folks we've interviewed in terms of you had some rights and services. Can you describe how you were treated? Uh, we were treated very well. The Commonwealth Attorney's Office uh, guided us through the system. They gave us a victim's advocate. They were always right, Johnny, on the spot to answer any questions we had. Uh, we were fortunate enough to, to have our own attorney as well who was of great, uh, great help, but uh, I have to compliment greatly the uh, Commonwealth Attorney's Office and the victims advocates and boy are they hardworking people. Great. Um, in terms of um, in your pioneering area which is automated victim notification, what do you think was the greatest challenge that you all faced in affecting change and getting other people to see the importance of um, a victim notification? I'd have to say it was uh, seeing that it really affects real people. That I think is why John and I were so very vocal and I, I do still a lot with, uh, with buying because it's not just a system. It's not just another system out there. It is a system that does a lot of good, and it does a lot of good for real people, but it protects them in a way that you don't ever see them. And if, if, if there wasn't um, automated notification, I think what would the end result be for a lot of the victims that now use the service? There would be a lot more crime. Yeah. I'm sure there would be. 
because we've heard stories from people who have been notified and if they hadn't been notified they would have been seriously injured or maybe even murdered. Um, when you were trying to get Vine set up initially in J-Town and then in, in Kentucky and now of course um, nationwide, what are some of the strategies that you employed that were successful in terms of um, getting people to understand the need for it but also to implement it? I think the news media, getting it out, uh, appearing on uh, some TV shows, uh, getting to know the, <coughs> pardon me, the local announcers and news uh, personnel so that they would recognize us and what we were attempting to do and, and getting their cooperation. Because it's, I think it's through the news media and the public that you can achieve these things. Without their support, you get nowhere. We also had a champion in Dave Armstrong who was the uh, county judge at the time. And he, he championed this cause through the um, Office for Women, which was run at the time by Marsha Roth. And Marsha Roth is now working. Marsha Roth is now the executive director of the Mary Byron Foundation. Great. And I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that in a second. When you talk about having a champion, um, do you think that makes a really big difference? Because you were trying to affect a major policy mm -hmm. change. Is that something that's absolutely necessary? Oh, I think so, without a doubt, because I've heard stories of how the fights that, you know, went on, you know, we don't need to spend this kind of money, and 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 Marsha and uh, Dave Armstrong were definitely uh, very pro this, because there was a law, but there were no teeth to back it up. Great. Um, any failures in terms of trying to implement Vine automated notification? I think there were a few minor issues. Uh, one occurred. And we were involved in it. We got a call early one morning that Donovan had been released. I called the uh, local Vine people and checked, and they said that he was being transferred from one jail to another. The problem was the same code was being used in the uh, Corrections Department computer system. For any time a person left one jail, they were essentially given a release code being transferred to another uh, state prison or facility. Well, they've since corrected that. They now have a separate code for transfer, and when you get a call, it now says they have been transferred. So you know the difference. And do you think with, because uh, technology sort of moves at the speed of sound, that um, that it's adapting to all the new, I think, new possibilities and learning from things like having the wrong codes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's, um, it's not a perfect system. Nothing is perfect. Uh, every now and then something will happen, but uh, I would say 99% of the time it's, it's spot on. Yeah. The, the only weakness I see in the system is uh, notification of victims as to how it works and that it is available to them because it is entirely a voluntary system. The victim must re call in and register or can uh, do it through the automated phone system they can register but the victim does not register the system will not work and it's getting this information out to victims that's so important the public awareness mm -hmm. piece. Um, if you were going to describe the one greatest accomplishment in the field of victims rights and services and this is the hardest question everyone has said what, what do you think is the biggest accomplishment um, we're 30 years old now gosh you know for us I'd say vine but I know that there have been major strides in giving rights to victims, such as having the right to be present in court, having the right to, to make a statement at the trial, uh, being treated. You know, victims don't want more. What they want is they want equal treatment under the law. The, def the, the perpetrator gets all these rights, and, and the victims just want the same amount. What do you think is needed today, um, John and Pat, to continue the, the growth of our field or what's missing in terms of the, the future of our field? I would have to say primarily public awareness. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we hear so much on the news about the current world situation and possible war. 
we hear of the economics, we hear of the world problems, we hear of sports and everything else, but victims do not seem to get the news media. Uh, if we get an article, it's usually buried very deeply in the newspaper, and if the TV media happens to have a, some time to fill, we may get some space. But we need more public service announcements, uh, uh, press and press uh, newspaper reporters to take an interest and to follow the articles and to follow up with us. We also need victims to get involved because you're victimized by the crime, you're victimized by the courts, and when it's all over, you just want to go away. And we want to get more people to stand up and say, I'm mad, I'm not going to take it anymore. Could you, um, having recently been to, to one of your groups in Kentucky, could you just talk a little bit about your mutual support groups and, and how that works? There are a lot of support groups out there, I do know. There's uh, Parents of Murdered Children and uh, a lot of other groups. We belong to a group in the statewide group in Kentucky called Kentuckians Voice for Crime Victims. And it was started by Earl and Ann Pruitt, who are wonderful people who have lost not only one son, but two to murder. Um, they have fought through the legislators in Frankfurt to get victims' rights in the state. And um, we are an organization of about a thousand people that uh, will go and we will lobby in Frankfurt and we will, um, if we can, we try to go to court and just sit there as a friend of the victim, which we are allowed to do under victims' rights, um, and just, you know, kind of be there for people. Mm, that's so wonderful. Um, and I hear Earl, Earl and Anna, just a lot of oh. people are going to hear that name and go, whoa. They're, they're great, great people. Yeah. They're I, great people. I'm there. I'm going to visit. If, if you had a new person coming in um, to, to volunteer or, or a recent victim, what advice can you give to people who've just recently joined the field based on, on your experiences? Don't give up. Also, I would have to say network. You can't do it by yourself. Uh, you need to support of those who have gone before you, those who have been there, who have made the contacts, uh, know the people to see, and uh, the way to present the material. It's hard to learn on your own. It's hard to get started use the resources that are available. Great advice. Um, the future. What vision do you both have for the future of our field? We're 30 years old for the next 10 or 20 years. It would, nice to, it would be nice to see it not have to have a future, that it was a peaceful world and, you know, everybody got along. But I think just the continuing support and uh, rights of victims of all crime. Uh, you, you see a lot of support for victims of violent crimes, but there are victims of other kind of crimes too that just go un, unrealized and maybe it's a poor choice of words, unappreciated, uh, because victimizing the person, it also victimizes all of society. I think what we need to do also is uh, I'd like to see the foundation grow and be able to become more active in the education of young people, especially if the sixth grade probably through the twelfth uh, in the problems with domestic violence. Our domestic violence is usually a learned item. It's uh, what they see at home, what they've seen on television. It's something children pick up on and it's not necessarily something we can eliminate, but maybe we can minimize if we can uh, educate the children as to what it is, especially the young women, uh, educate them as to what the signs are of control that lead to domestic violence, uh, what situations to avoid, what to watch out for in relationships, things of that nature. I think education may be a good part of the key to minimizing the crime. And is that um, a goal of the, tell us a little bit about the Mary Byron Foundation. It's a couple years old now. Yes, we are. And uh, we were formed by a seed grant from Aperis Corporation, who is the providers of the Vine system. And uh, 
We, our mission is to educate and to find innovative programs throughout the United States that will end or at least break the cycle of domestic violence. And um, re I know recently you did a, a, a call to the field and you got quite a few responses. There's a lot of good stuff out there. We're, we're doing a program uh, because we're such new kids on the block and uh, so we're doing a program, it's called, awards program called Celebrating Solutions. And we sent out a request for anybody who had any kind of program that they thought was of merit that needed funding, and we're hoping to fund 10 of them at uh, $10,000 each. No strings attached. Uh, and uh, we got over 300 applications, which we have whittled down to 30. And we have recently sent out a second uh, set of questionnaires, and we will take that 30, and we will whittle it down. And hopefully in the in the spring, somewhere in April, hopefully that we will we will announce four awards, Great. and it's throughout the United States. Excellent. Um, uh, both of you were also just recently um, elected to the board of the National Victims Constitutional Amendment Network. This isn't an official question. It, do you think it's important to have a federal amendment? And if you think it's important, why? <clears throat> Why is that? Well, I think uh, this was first brought up in 1996 when we first met with President Clinton. I asked him at that time if we couldn't get a federal law for victims notification in the Savine system. And at the time he said he was aware of it and he would have to look into it. We were called back again a few months later to Washington where he made a public announcement that it would be a U.S. constitutional amendment. The major difference being if we had it as a federal law, it would only have pertained to federal crimes in the federal court system. If we can get it as a constitutional amendment, then it pertains to everyone in every territory covered by the United States, including those military facilities overseas, and it would be a right that no one could question in court and no one could deny a victim. So that is why we went for the constitutional amendment. You feel pretty strongly yeah. about that. Yes, we do. Yeah, uh, we what do you, you think is going to be needed? Um, and uh, as you know, we have an expanded, really fabulous yes. board now. Um, and Senator Kyle's introduced SJ1 mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. year. What's going to be needed to really make this a reality? Because it's been introduced for 10 years now. I think we need to have a grassroots effort and get people informed, get them to talk to their legislators, their senators, their representatives, and um, let them know how important that it is. Because it can happen to anybody. Crime can happen to anybody. It's not restricted to, to one class of people. It is a social, e uh, economical, religious, trans it just transcends all those, uh, those Barriers. Another thing I think we need, I've been following it closely, and it has been scheduled for the Senate floor for a vote. However, every time some world problem has come up mm -hmm. or some major situation mm -hmm. that has sidetracked this item from the vote. I think we need to uh, get a few senators to push to get it up there again for a vote, and the same thing in the House of Representatives. We need to get a few champions there who work with us and get it to the forefront. I think it will pass if we can get it there. Woohoo! That's yeah. why we have you yeah, two on yeah. the board. It's not going to cost money. It's just going to. Yeah. It's just going to. You know. That's great. It's just something that needs to be passed. Well, is is there anything I didn't ask you this morning that you'd mm. like to Dang talk it. about? At this point, uh, I don't think so. No, yeah. I, at this point, I can't think of anything else that we didn't cover. Yeah. Uh, this is just a, a good example that, that I brought about public awareness for Vine. Uh, we're surprised how many people still in Jefferson County and the state of Kentucky still don't know what Vine is and what it will do for them. Vine uh, system also has been recently making the newspaper on national articles. 
and up for its place in other states. So we still need to get the word out a lot. It's obvious from the uh, what we've been reading that many people do not know that this is available to them. And would you also say uh, the Mary Byron Found Foundation? Foundation, Louisville, okay. Kentucky. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Pat Byron, B Y R O N, Mary Byron Foundation, President, Louisville, Kentucky. John Byron, B Y R O N, Vice President, Mary Byron Foundation, Louisville, Kentucky.